Greetings, beloveds. It is from a deep place of love and thankfulness that I welcome you to our 2021 Side with Love Sunday. This is our 12th annual Side with Love or Season of Love um, celebration. And without you, without you, each of you choosing love over and over and over again, we would not be the faith tradition that we are, and we wouldn't be in this moment, a moment where we can be together, a moment where we are invited to listen to the offerings of all the different participants spreading their theology of love from their own perspectives, from their own backgrounds, from their own lived experiences. At the same time, it is a call, it is a call and response to us to really embody, to live into love, to live into the values of practices associated with the UU faith, to be in right relationship with movement at this moment. I always say to myself and even to my son, Elijah, I ask us, what is love calling us to do? In this moment, as you enjoy and listen and absorb and allow yourself to be changed um, by the words you'll hear from the wonderful people that will, um, that will be coming up next. I hope you will hold on to what is love asking you to do. And throughout this year and throughout your years, may you constantly, continuously, with rigor and intentionality, choose love over and over again. Welcome beloveds. Thank you, thank you for your time, and thank you for being you. This is a holy moment. gathered together, it is a special and unique moment with hearts together. Oh, 
holy place when our heart is in a holy place holy place we are blessed with love and amazing prayer when our heart is in a holy place When our heart is in, when our heart is in, a holy place. Reach out and touch somebody if you can. When our heart is in, a holy place. Let them know that your heart is with them. Be our blessed with love and amazing grace. When our heart is in, a holy place. When our heart Love once, the fullest unfolding of every person. Love once, everyone to be free, to feel safe, to know joy. To me, love is an overflowing and unconditional love for the world and for creation and for one another. That spiritual foundation of love calls us to the policies and the practices that we need to sustain and nurture life, thriving life. Love means thinking about how we enact policies that make people's lives better. If we're talking about racial justice, love is acknowledging that there has been wrong, that there has been harm, and that whether you participated in it or not, you're benefiting from the inequitable results of that harm. What if love means letting go of what we think we know and being curious about what more there is to learn? What if love was not a commodity that could be bought and sold? Sometimes love isn't waiting for the other to come to us so that we can become agents of welcome, but rather us moving into the world to engage with others in their spaces, on their terms. Love asks for the release of all assumptions about who wants to be part of Unitarian Universalism. Love asserts that each of us matters and is worthy Love knows our life-saving, life-giving faith must be available to every person who needs it. If you have a chalice at home, would you please light it? In honor and in celebration of overflowing and liberating love. My name is Tuli and I have a story for you. In a little bit, you are going to hear about how there came to be an agreement between some inhabitants of the earth. An agreement is sometimes called a promise or a contract or even a covenant. All these words mean similar things, that two or more people or animals or others have come together and agreed on something. 
and not necessarily two or more people. Sometimes we have to have an agreement within ourselves, with ourselves. And it can be hard to come to an agreement. Think of a time when this might have been for you. Perhaps you wanted to play Legos, but your friend did not. Perhaps you wanted to pretend play to be on a ship and your brother or sister wanted to read a book. Or maybe you witnessed someone doing something and you wanted to convince them to not do it. How did it work out? Did you have to give up what you were doing? Did the other person have to? It can be hard, right? Sometimes, even after we have reached an agreement and decided how to work or play together, it might not be carried out and more disagreement might arise. And we might feel very hurt and upset. Can you think of a time when that happened to you? Someone agreed to do something and then couldn't do it. Or you were promised something and then the promise was broken. How did that feel? We are all going to make mistakes and break promises, even though we might have tried very hard not to. What makes this even more complicated is that there might be another person who is hurt by what we decide or agree to. We might not even see them or know that they are being affected. As Unitarian Universalists, it's important for us to try again and again to come to new agreements and to understand how we were hurt or might have hurt someone else. We might even carry our hurt with us for a long time. And we might have to be open to hearing that we have caused hurt, even though we didn't mean to. But we can try to work hard to repair the damage that might have been done, either to us or by us. In fact, this is an obligation, something we have to try to do. Sometimes this can be tiring and take a really long time and we might have to give up something or have the other person give up something. We can make new agreements and begin anew. As you listen to what's coming up, think about what each of the creatures had to do to come to this new agreement. The Agreement by Barry Lopez one time, before there were any people walking around this valley, there were bear people. There were also salmon people. The bear people had an agreement with the salmon people. The salmon would come upriver every fall, and the bear would acknowledge this and take what they needed. This is the way it was with everything. Everyone lived by certain agreements and courtesies. But the salmon people and the bear people had no agreement with the river. It had been overlooked. No one thought it was even necessary. Well, it was. One fall, the river pulled itself back into the shore trees and wouldn't let the salmon enter from the ocean. Whenever they would try, the river would pull back and leave the salmon stranded on the beach. There was a long argument a lot of talk. Finally, the river let the salmon enter. But when the salmon got up into this country where the bears lived, the river began to run in two directions at once, north on one side, south on the other, roaring, heaving white water and rolling big boulders up on the banks. Then the river was suddenly still. The salmon were afraid to move. The bears were standing behind the trees looking out. The river said in the middle of all this silence that there had to be an agreement. No one could just do something, whatever they wanted. You just don't take someone for granted. So for several days they spoke about it. The salmon said who they were and where they came from, and the bears spoke about what they did, what powers they had been given, and the river spoke about its agreement with the rain and the wind and the crayfish. Everybody said what they needed and what they would give away. Then a very odd thing happened. The river said it loved the salmon. No one had ever said anything like this before. No one had taken this chance. It was an honesty that pleased everyone. It made for a very deep agreement among them. 
well, they were able to reach an understanding about their obligations to each other, and so everyone went their way. This remains unchanged. Time has nothing to do with this. This is not a story. When you feel the river shuddering against your legs, you are feeling the presence of all these agreements. All right, everybody. Please rise and body your spirit as you're able. It's time for the love train. Everybody, put your hands together. Or just move from side to side as you're able. Yeah, it's all in love. People all over the world join hands, start a love train, love train. People all over the world join hands, start a love train, love train. Everybody, people all over the world. them pronouns to refer to me. I'm so glad you're here with me and my trans and non-binary, queer, disabled, surviving poverty, first generation with access to college, self. Welcome, dear ones. Welcome, welcome, welcome. We are here, yes, and there's so much that fractures our we. In Unitarian Universalism, our assumptions about each other so often fracture our sense of we. I wish for us to love on and heal our we. And so, I want to talk to all of my disabled UU siblings, my trans and non-binary UU siblings, and my UU siblings who are surviving poverty. My world makes so much more sense when I'm with y'all. The gaslighting and rejection and weirdness of the great wide world, and yes, of many Unitarian Universalist gatherings, can lessen and become background noise to our vibrant, honest, and passionate conversations. When we're together, I can slow down and relax. 
I can work with y'all to make sure more folks are included. And that means me too. I want you to know how much I love your ways of being. I love your being. I love how you use your imagination to discover and create ways to survive. And I wish with all my heart and soul you didn't have to. We are trans and non-binary and disabled and surviving poverty. And we know we need to navigate a dominant culture that is more toxic to us than anything else. We know we must build community and culture that values our lived experiences and nurtures our survival. We know we are practicing the rejection of ableism and transphobia and elitism and ageism and homophobia and racism and all exclusion. Oh, and I love how we already know that inclusion means all of all of us and hospitality means honoring folks as their full selves. We know we need disability justice, queer theology, funding of expenses, access accommodations, inclusive language, scholarships, plain language explanations, gender neutral bathrooms, child care, and all the things that can make it possible for us to be safe and well, loved and held sacred within Unitarian Universalism writ large. I wish that every event that is planned moving forward is planned with us in mind and considering what we need. I wish that more and more reflections, sermons, and sacred texts include us and our wisdom. And in all the ways that you engage Unitarian Universalism, I wish that you will find folks who understand that you are worthy and you matter and who choose to include you. Our collective spiritual growth and resilience are important, not just to us, but to all Unitarian Universalists. So now I want to talk to all Unitarian Universalists. I want us all together to build our resistance to the many assumptions folks make about who is in the room, who is at the table, and who is in Unitarian Universalist spaces, online and otherwise. I pray that each of us decides to begin to heal our we. I pray that we cast off assumptions and choose to build a Unitarian Universalism that holds each and every person sacred and worthy of hospitality and inclusion. May we know our potential for love and beauty. We are love and beauty. Real love that stretches to encompass our human fallibility we all have. Resilient love that unfurls to create and support our vulnerability we need to thrive actual beauty that honors all seasons, phases, and aspects of life. Fierce love and fierce beauty. Fierce enough to stay in touch with and reflect reality. We are beautiful, smart, and strong. We are fallible, whole, and vulnerable. We are right here right now. We matter. So may it be for you. So may it be for me. So may it be for all of us.
I love me a good anti-racism workshop. From the very first one that I led back in 1994, back then we used to call them diversity sessions, I got hooked. I found it was so powerful, so exciting to help a group of people engage in conversations about their social location, their commitment to change, their desire for justice. It was really, really amazing and um, an early formational experience that led me down this vocational path. It's also true that it wasn't until I came to Unitarian Universalism that I found my true home in doing this work. Because before that, I used to do this work in academia and in nonprofit spaces, and it was much more of a brainy, heady thing. It was, it was about the ideas and the sociology, which of course is very important and it's central to the work. But once I discovered the possibility of having these conversations as faith formation, everything shifted for me. It was so powerful to be in a covenantal space where we already agree to be in right relationship with each other and to be um, loving with each other and to return to right relationship. And in that container, to start understanding how our anti-racism work and our focus on anti-oppression and justice helps us shift our own meaning making and our understanding of our location in the world, like really deep theological questions about where do I belong and what are my values and principles and what are my responsibilities? These, these questions engaged in a faith context are completely different complete game changer and I really appreciated that. Now it's true that I really enjoy designing a good workshop, having an arc, knowing what's going to happen, planning for things and then having them occur the way that I planned. I mean that's very satisfying. Yes, as a facilitator it is one of my favorite things. And I am discovering that the most powerful learning actually occurs when we go off the agenda. When we go off the agenda, it's usually because something has happened in the room and we need to attend to something that shifted. So it could be that someone says something that's like a microaggression. It could be that the learning in the room requires us to pivot. The questions that are coming up are not following the original plan. But ultimately, what's exciting about that is that we are responding to the embodied learned experience in that moment. We are responding to the people in the room and to the, the actual moment. That's something that Elandria taught me, and I want to lift his name up. I miss you, Elandria. Embodied learning and focusing on how we do it and why we do it in the moment makes all the difference. It's praxis. It's different than just this theoretical understanding of the concepts of racism and race and white supremacy culture and all this other stuff. It's also true that when we interrupt the process and we attend to what's happening in the room, it's important to center the person who may have been harmed. And usually the person who has been harmed is a person with a marginalized identity. And that is valuable to remember as a principle in our work. We center the folks who have the lived experience and who in the moment have something to offer through their, through their experience and through the moment. Doesn't mean that we put people of color and people with marginalized identities on pedestals as educators and experts. It means that we respond in the moment to what's happening. We use the holy muscle of interruption to trust that being with each other in real time is the most important learning. Understanding how power is playing in the room in that moment is one of the most important ways that we can actually decenter the traditional ways of doing things. Because otherwise, in our own educational settings, we still have white supremacy culture dominating and running us. And that's what we are trying to decenter. So I lift up a prayer for all of you who are engaged in this important work of keeping it real, of keeping connected to each other and saying what's true in the moment. 
may we continue to strengthen that muscle. May we continue to trust that truth telling and speaking truth to power is one of the ways that we do this liberation work. May it be so and amen. I'm so glad we all have a guide. Mm -hmm. And that God is love. Look over and tell somebody near you that God is love. Yeah. Love will guide us. Peace has tried us. Hope inside us will lead the way. On the road from grief to giving, love will guide us through the heart. If you cannot sing like angels, if you cannot sing like angels, if you cannot speak before thousands, you can give from, you can give from. Within you, you can change the world with your love. Love will guide us. Love will guide us. Peace has tried us. Hope inside us. Hope inside us. We'll lead the way. The moment right now. Come on, everybody, come on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Love will God. moment, even if it doesn't feel like it, life is giving us an invitation. I really believe that. I really believe that in every moment, life is giving us an invitation to do the things that are the most loving and life-affirming. And that doing the loving and life-affirming thing is always the answer when you don't know what to do or if you're feeling unsure. There's always a moment of invitation to rethink or reevaluate. We're being invited into this cosmic dance of renewal and joy and justice, but you have to make the justice. It doesn't just show up without our participation or our effort. Things don't get better just by us waiting for them to happen. We all have to engage in the better making from wherever we are, and each moment presents an invitation for us to do that. I don't want us to forget that. Even if, like me, you are tired or feeling frustrated or feeling unsure, the invitation to participate in life in a manner that is about living our values, living love and justice, is still there no matter what else is going on. Ask yourself, what's the most loving, life-affirming thing that I can do in this moment for myself or for other people? Sometimes it's get some rest. Sometimes it's apologize for something you've done. 
Sometimes it's reconsider how you're using your money or other resources in the broader world. To me, if we're talking about race and justice, love is about acknowledging that there has been wrong, that there has been harm perpetrated, and that whether you personally feel like you participated in it or not, you are likely benefiting from the inequitable results of that harm. Even if you are a person who wants to say, well, I didn't participate in making things this way, if you are benefiting from the ill-gotten gains, then you have some responsibility to make things right especially if you then turn around and say that you believe in justice and equity. You are not let off the hook, no matter what. When we have broader conversations about reparations or what it looks like to repair, particularly the harms that have been done to indigenous communities, black communities, other communities of color, I believe that love means thinking about the resources that enable life. So what does reparation look like at the intersection of communities of color and healthcare, or um, communities of color and education. What does it look like to have those kinds of conversations beyond you know, just conversations about money and land that is owed, but also about accessing resources that have been inequitably distributed for more than a century? All of us should have a hand in those conversations, and all of us have some responsibility to bring about justice in those contexts. Plainly, if you're not going to do that work, if you're not going to be committed to thinking about that and how you can serve in that work, then to me, it obfuscates the mandate of what it means to be Unitarian Universalist. Because ours is a faith that calls us to do things. Being Unitarian Universalist in part means maybe you don't pray the way I pray. Maybe you don't pray at all. But how do we live together in equitable community, despite what I might think about God or what you might think about God? This is a faith that calls us to commit to the work of making justice. This is a faith that calls us to think about what it means not to believe the same, but to live together in beloved community, despite our own discrete perspectives about spirituality or the afterlife. That is a part of the call, the mandate of what it is to be Unitarian Universalist, to figure out how we live together in loving, equitable, just relationship with each other. I believe that the proof of our faith is the extent to which we do that. The proof of our faith is not in some confession that we make. The proof of our faith is not in some words that we say. The essence of our endeavor, the proof of what we believe is in how we do the work of bringing about love, justice, and community. As Unitarian Universalists, I think we've given up perhaps too quickly on notions of salvation. If we think about the notion of being saved from harm, I don't know that it's actually possible to have personal salvation beyond the community. You know, there's no way for you to have salvation and some kind of perfect flourishing life outcome while everything around you is suffering and burning because we're all connected. We are. If COVID hasn't reaffirmed in your mind that we're all connected, I really don't know what to tell you. Here we are right now, suffering through a global pandemic together, People are passing a deadly virus to each other through our breath that we can't see. That's a metaphor for us all being connected if I've ever heard one. I think it's something that we would do well to think about and remember. Our salvation is intimately tied up in each other's ability to see other people as worthwhile. All human beings as valuable and possessing dignity. All life is having value and possessing dignity. Now that's not the same as liking me. This is not, I need you to like me. This is not, I need us to be best friends so that we can go to the shopping mall together. You know, this is understand that I have as much of a right to human thriving and flourishing as anybody else, and that I have as much to offer as anyone else. And so do you. How do we create a context where all of that is possible, where all that human thriving and life is possible? That's going to require sacrifice and time and deep listening and nuance. But that's what being a Unitarian Universalist requires. Other faith traditions ask for other things. This is what Unitarian Universalism asks of us. This is what we signed up for. And to me, this is serious. The call of our faith is critical right now. Ours is not a faith of anything goes. When I hear people say, I'm a UU because I can believe whatever I want, that's actually the furthest thing from the truth. It's time to lean into whether or not we really believe it. 
Or are we just saying it to give ourselves the illusion of faith community? You know, so we can feel like we have some kind of faith tradition. Do we really believe in the values of our faith enough to enact them in the larger world in a manner that is bold and clear and unequivocal? People need to know, especially in this moment, what our commitments are. And if we're gonna say that we are a faith that is committed to justice, equity, and compassion in human relations, we have to actually do that. It's not just about saying the thing, we have to do the thing. Frankly, I'd feel better if we did less saying and more doing. I need us to have the collective maturity now to do what it is our faith asks us to do. Amen, Amin, Ashe. Love is asking something of us. And Unitarian Universalism is demanding something of us. It can be a lot to take the thoughts that are moving through our mind and to let them trickle down and integrate into our hearts, into our spirits. Let's go there now. Our worship service is shifting into a time of devotion and contemplation where we can be alone with ourselves, with the breath, and with that which is larger than us. comfortable and relaxed wherever you are, whether at your desk or on your couch or on the floor. Um, if you were just, you know, relax your shoulders. Breathe in, breathe out. Loosen your jaw. Close your eyes. And 
you think about all that you are experiencing in the world. Think about all who are struggling during this time of isolation as we continue to grapple with the COVID-19 pandemic. Think of all those who have lost loved ones and all those who are still living with the side effects. Think of those who are still traumatized by the events of January 6th. Who are seeking answers and accountability where there is none. Think about this new day. Hold the great anxiety that we all have with the joy of accomplishment of those who work so hard around the country to ensure that our votes were counted. Now come back to yourself in your home, in your family, and all that you have to do. May you be well, and may you be blessed. Amen, Ashe, may it be so. As you extinguish your chalice at home, may we give thanks for this time together, for the wisdom and inspiration that we've received. May we carry that wisdom into our lives, and into our communities. May you find untapped sources of strength and courage and discover in yourself a new fire that burns in your belly and keeps you going. May the presence of spirit be proximate, cooling and reassuring to you when you are overheated. May we all together choose to build a Unitarian Universalism that holds each and every person sacred and worthy of hospitality and inclusion. May you be well. Beloveds, as we leave this sacred time together, let us remember to praise this gift of life to be attentive to its wonder and its beauty. May we kindle more love, more joy, and more song into our hearts and into our days. May we be led out in peace and may we give back love. Sometimes in our life, we all have pain, we all have sorrow, but if we are wise, we know that there's always tomorrow. Lean on me when you're not strong. Can you say that? I'll be your friend. Let me hear you. I'll help you carry on. For it won't be long. I'm going to need somebody to lead. Lean on me. 
recognize it already. It is truly all we need. I want you to sing it with us. Come on. All you need is love. Yeah. All you need is love. All you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. Everybody sing. All you need is love. I love it, Rick. All you need is love. All you need is love. Love. Love is all you need. Love, love, love. Love, love, love. Love, love, love. Everybody say. Oh, yeah. 